Welcome to Saskatoon Temple. Thank you for joining us. Due to the rise in the number of COVID cases in Saskatchewan in the last couple of weeks, we've become increasingly concerned about our in-person services. We're going to have uh, four weeks of virtual services. So thank you for joining us this morning. <laughs> Applying for a new job has got to be one of the most stressful times in a person's life. Now I have to admit, I have not applied for very many jobs. I've been a Salvation Army officer for 40 years, but I did apply for a job right out of high school. It was a, a telephone operator position that I had applied for. So I went to the interview and I had to sit in a room with the interviewer and she brought out this what looked like several questions and said to me could you write down the following numbers so she read off all of these numbers and I wrote them down she then checked my numbers looked at me and say con and said congratulations you've just got this position <laughs> the low was the bar was set very low if you could write numbers you were in and I was in <laughs> But uh, I haven't applied for many positions, but I have interviewed, uh, done the interviewing many times. And it can be so stressful on people. I try to make them uh, feel a little bit more relaxed and comfortable. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't work. I remember interviewing a young girl uh, years ago, and I, I really liked her. And I wanted her to get the job, but she was so nervous in the interview. I actually asked and answered every single question while she just shook her head yes or no. She was so nervous. <laughs> anyway, she didn't get the job, but uh, I really liked her. But some people get so nervous because it is a stressful time. Well, today we're going to look at a type of job interview. It wasn't so much as an interview 
because the guy didn't really apply for the job. It just sort of fell from the sky, literally fell from the sky. The man's name was Ezekiel. We're going to talk about him today and learn a little bit about his life. We're going to look at his mission, and we want to look at the message that he gave the people that he talked to. Well, first of all, let's look at who he was, the man. I'm sure you've heard about him, Ezekiel. Songs have been written about him. You might remember that Sunday school song, Ezekiel saw Wheela rolling way in the middle of the air. Uh, also, the dry bones in Ezekiel, you've probably heard of him. Another song about that, Dem Bones, Dem Bones, Dem Dry Bones, you know that one. Um, Ezekiel was uh, quite a character. Let me give you a bit of history. Way back when the children of Israel were wandering in the desert, they finally came to the Promised Land. It was time to cross over and live the life that they had been dreaming about for 40 years. Moses had a few last words for them. You'll find them in Deuteronomy, chapters 28 to 33. He had a lot to say. Deuteronomy 28, verses 1 to 2, say, says this. If you fully obey the Lord your God and carefully follow all his commands I give you today, the Lord our God will set you high above the nations on earth. All the blessings will come upon you and accompany you if you obey the Lord your God. And he goes on for 14 more verses to explain all the blessings that these people will get when they cross over if they follow God. Then in verse 15, he starts a description of the curses for disobedience. However, if you do not obey the Lord your God and do not carefully follow all his commands and decrees I am giving you today, all these curses will come upon you and overtake you. And then Moses goes on to list all those curses. So in summary, love God, follow his commandments, love God and you'll be okay. If you don't, look out, there'll be trouble. God had rescued Israel from slavery in Egypt. He had given them a rich land and presented them with a grand system of worship and government centering on him. He would be no distant God, no distant God in the heavens. He would live with them. But after some initial enthusiasm, the Israelites didn't continue the way God had pointed Instead, they learned to live with the people they found as their neighbors, people who did not know or worship the God of Israel. As Israel mixed and mingled with their neighbors, they began to lose sight of their national identity. They worshipped the idols Baal and Asherah alongside Yahweh, the God of Israel. They listened to their neighbors who seemed to convince them that Baal was in control of the seasons, in control of the weather, and Asherah was actually the goddess of the earth itself. Yahweh seemed to be the warrior god, the god of the desert, the god who came in times of crisis and saved his people. But when they were living in peace, they were working the land, they were farmers, Perhaps they needed or felt they needed to rely on the God of the seasons and the earth in everyday life. Syncretism, the union of different and opposing practices, that's what began to happen. They worshipped Yahweh, they worshipped Baal, they threw in a little worship of Asherah. The Hebrew people didn't want to offend any god, so they thought they would try it all out, worship them all. There they were, in the land God had promised Israel, the land of their dreams, a land where they would not be under the cruel tyranny of Egypt, the land where they could stop wandering, stop searching. This was the place. 
where before they entered, they heard that warning from Moses. Worship God, and everything will be all right. Worship God, and he will bless you. If you turn your back on him and forget all that he did for you, expect that there will be trouble. And soon Israel did just that, forgot all about their promise to be faithful to God and only God. In the incorporation of Baal and Asherah into their worship of God, there were consequences. Things got so bad, people pretty much turned their back on God completely. And God, who loved them so deeply, continued to try to get their attention. One of those methods of trying to get their attention was to give them over to what they were doing. The other gods they worshipped would not save them from invading armies. So instead of living their lives out in the promised land, their nation was overtaken by the Babylonians and they were dragged away from the promised land to live in captivity once again. Ezekiel was one of those who got dragged away in exile in the first group, as did a man named Daniel. You might remember him from the lion's den. Ezekiel's voice blended in stereo with Jeremiah still in Jerusalem. Both prophets warned their people that the captives were going to be in Babylon for a long time. But God did not forget them. He continued to send prophets to remind his people that he was the one true God and that he longed for them to return to him. Well, that gives us a little snapshot of who Ezekiel was. Well, let's look at his mission. This is, this is where we find Ezekiel, living with his countrymen, in captivity in Babylon. They knew the God of their history, but they had also turned to other gods and other influences. Ezekiel's call to become a prophet of God started out with a mind-blowing experience. You can read all about it in Ezekiel chapter 1. There was a windstorm, clouds with flashing lights surrounded by a brilliant light. In the center of this was fire that looked like glowing metal. In the fire was what looked like four living creatures. Four creatures had the form of a man, but each had four faces and four wings. It almost sounds like a Star Trek episode, doesn't it? <laughs> Legs were straight, feet like a calf. Faces looked like a man, lion, ox, and eagle. Hands under their wings. It goes on in Ezekiel chapter 1. Undoubtedly, this was probably the freakiest thing that he ever saw. And he fell face down on the ground. And he heard the voice of one speaking. The job interview begins. Let me read from Ezekiel chapter 2. And he, God, said to me, Ezekiel, son of man, stand on your feet and I will speak to you. Then the spirit came into me and raised me to my feet. And I heard him speaking to me. He said, son of man, I am sending you to the Israelites, to a rebellious nation that had rebelled against me. They and their fathers have been in revolt against me to this very day. The people whom I'm sending you to are obstinate and stubborn. Say to them, this is what the sovereign Lord says, and whether they listen or fail to listen, for they are a rebellious house, they will know that a prophet has been among them. And you, son of man, do not be afraid of them or their words, do not be afraid, though briars and thorns are all around you and you live among scorpions. Don't be afraid of what they say or terrified by them, though they are a rebellious house. Now, this might have stopped the interview for me, I have to confess. <laughs> don't be afraid. Don't be terrified. 
even though briars and thorns are all around you and your workstation is going to be among scorpions. Yikes, this does not sound like a job that I would want to interview for. Uh, health and safety would certainly have uh, something to say about that and the working conditions. But God continues. You must speak my words to them, whether they listen or fail to listen, for they are rebellious. But you, son of man, listen to what I say. Do not rebel like that rebellious house. I wonder what that would look like in a job description. I actually tried to write it out in the Salvation Army format. <laughs> Did not work well. <laughs> I have no idea what the pay grade would be either. <laughs> How interesting, though, that as God is talking about they, they are rebellious, they are stubborn, they are obstinate, he's really talking about Ezekiel. That's there is people. Right? That's his friends, his family, his neighbors. Not like Jonah that we've been listening to over the last four weeks who got sent to this horrible place, to these horrible people. No, Ezekiel got sent next door. That was his place where he had to uh, communicate his message. These were his people. God wanted to communicate with his people. He did not want to remain vague or far off. He wanted his people to know him. God's aim was to make himself known. God warned Ezekiel that the Israelites were unlikely to listen, even from captivity. They preferred idols to the living God. Yet Ezekiel's messages, his drama, the visions continued to come year after year. It was as though God were saying through him, some way, someday, I will get through to them. If the message doesn't reach their hearts one way, I will try another. That was Ezekiel's mission, to go to that rebellious nation and give them a message from God. You might remember Jonah's message. You're bad. You're no good. There's no hope. You're dead. He was not preaching any kind of message of hope, was he? That was not Ezekiel's message. That was not the message that God wanted Ezekiel to give these people. Ezekiel did some very bizarre things. When you read the book, you'll be shaking your head and thinking, what is he doing? <laughs> it's crazy stuff that he was doing. But God was trying to get uh, an obstinate people to pay attention. The thing that struck me as I read through the book was the obedience of Ezekiel. Every time God told him to do something or say something, he did it. His life was a life of obedience. His heart was undivided. Ezekiel chapter 11, verse 19 the message to those rebellious people is so powerful. Remember, they had consistently turned their back on God and turned to other gods and other influences. Yet, here is the message that God wanted his people to hear. I will give them an undivided heart. I will put a new spirit in them. I will remove from them their heart of stone, and give them a heart of flesh. I will give them an undivided heart. They had been searching and trying so many things, but God was going to give them an undivided heart. Jesus recognized the need for an undivided heart. In 2011, we were privileged to go to the Holy Land. We went to Caesarea Philippi. And we stood in front of this mountain and cliffs. And as, we, as, I, as I looked, there were like little holes that were dug into the cliff. And our uh, tour guide began to explain that this was the place people would bring their uh, idols 
dig a little hole in the cliff, put their idol there, their god, and they would, that's where they would come and worship their god. So it was covered with these little holes that would have held their little god. And it was there, that was the backdrop, that Jesus said to Peter, who do men say that I am? Because there was lots of options, right, in that all those gods that people were serving. Who do men say that I am? And Peter, of course, said, well, some say that you're Elijah. Some say that you're John the Baptist reincarnated. And then Jesus said, Peter, who do you say that I am? And with an undivided heart, Peter said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Isn't that profound? I was so moved to be standing in that place. I've read that story a hundred times in the Bible, but to stand there in front of that place, in front of all those little holes that held those idols, it was so moving. It would have been in this area with all the different spatterings of worldviews, all the different religions, all the different philosophies, all the different pagan thought systems. And Jesus, right there, with this as his backdrop for Peter, asked that question. Asked that question. An undivided heart answered. Well, we're living in a time when so many of us, so many of our normal activities that fill our minds and lives are stripped away. We've been given a chance to pause, to determine what is really important in our hearts and lives. This has been going on for a long time now, hasn't it? From March, I think, 15th, when it all started. And life changed for all of us. For many of us, we have been given a new appreciation of what it means to spend time with our family and friends. We have a new appreciation of what it would be like to hug our friends again. We still can't do that. We have a new appreciation for large celebrations, weddings, funerals, birthday parties, whatever. We can't do that right now, but we have a new appreciation for it. We have a new appreciation for gathering with fellow believers, to be able to shake a hand and catch up on what's happening in another person's life, to be able to sing without a mask, we have a new appreciation. So I ask myself, and we ask ourselves, what is our response to Ezekiel's words? Is that your prayer? God, give me an undivided heart, a heart that is truly yours, a heart that reflects who God is. This morning, I wonder if you could ask yourself, and I will ask myself, who holds my heart? Who holds your heart? I would invite you to pray for that undivided heart. I would invite you to pray that you would be still enough, quiet enough, to see the God of the undivided heart to see his hand in this world that he has created, to hear his voice through his word, through his people. There's a beautiful song that we're going to listen to as we quiet our hearts and minds. And the words are a prayer. Change my heart, O God. Make it ever true. Change my heart, O God, may I be like you. You are the potter, I am the clay. Make me and mold me, this is what I pray. Change my heart, O God, make it ever true. Change my heart, O God, may I be like you. 
And as we listen to this song, I'd invite you to pray for that undivided heart. God bless you. Change my heart, oh.